We have three excellent papers. Our first paper will be delivered by uh, William Caffaro at, at uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you, Marianne, and I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, the topic of alternate currencies in late medieval Europe is often, rightly or wrongly, and from this conference, clearly wrongly, uh, linked to money supply, which has long been the subject of spirited debate. Scholars have devoted much work to the late 14th and 15th century bullion famine, and John Monroe's name has been mentioned numerous times here, a discourse stimulated in the first instance by the famous prosperity versus hard times, Lopez Chipola debate about the effects of pestilence and crises of the era. Monetary historians cite numerous interrelated factors, including mint production, international balance of payments, coin hoards, among others. This paper examines alternate currencies used during the crises of the second half of the Trecento. Um, in Italy, to make payments to soldiers. While scholars generally agree that war tightened markets and created stretezza of money supply, there remains much that we do not know and variables that have not yet been investigated, including the fundamental issue of how soldiers were actually paid. The lacuna reflects the unfortunate compartmentalization of study that has relegated war to its own self-contained subfield, and not a popular one, known as military history, which since Machiavelli and the nationalist writers of the Risorgimento, Ricotti, Canestrini, the others, um, has focused primarily on moral issues related to the reliance on mercenary soldiers whose famous greed for gold coins replaced native martial spirit and contributed to a dramatic rise in the cost of warfare. The status quo is changing with, with a young generation of Italian, excellent Italian scholars. But as the monetary historian Rory Naismith, writing just a couple of years ago, has recently reminded us, the highly technical nature of medieval monetary history remains, quote, at a distance from the mainstream of historical research, generally speaking. Uh, the lack of communication among scholars bears emphasis. Anglophone scholars who have investigated both war and money supply traditionally highlight the Hundred Years' War, whose very name gives it pride of place in such discussions just as the main protagonists, England and France, have served as focal points for the consideration of money supply. Nevertheless, the Hundred Years' War involved long truces and few campaigns in the field, most of which were accidental. War was far more frequent in Trecento, Italy, owing to numerous contentious states jostling for space on the geographically small peninsula, which, as Jakob Burkhardt firmly famously noted, was connected to the destabilizing external political forces of papacy and empire that lay at the root of much of the discord. From an economic and monetary perspective, and this is what I'm working on in a book, uh, among other things, the papacy and empire deserve closer examinations as inputs and outputs into the Italian economy, alongside the concomitant involvement of French and Hungarian Angevin royal houses in the Civil War in the Kingdom of Naples. The latter, Hungary, uh, was a major source of gold in the 14th century, just as Florence stopped actually making it, uh, uh, um, printing up, minting it. The present essay looks at the realities of payments to soldiers, which included compensation in kind, as well as the use of paper instruments, most notably the bill of exchange, whose utility as a, as a quote, flexible friend, to paraphrase an important re recent essay by Bolton and Guidi Bruscoli, who was, who was here before, um, uh, comes into focus on the battlefield. The use of bills was accompanied by the use of other paper instruments called generically bolete or less generically ap apodice, which comes from the Greek uh, meaning proof, which were notarial documents, slips of paper, used as receipts for payment to soldiers um, 
as well as communal officials more generally, but which later morphed into more versatile, complex instruments. I intended to actually speak about these in much greater length, but they still confound me. Um, the reality, however, is um, at base, for all the discussion of warfare and greed for gold, there was a significant contemporary paper trail that has gone largely unnoticed by scholars. What may be said without hesitation is that war placed burdens on stocks of gold and silver and that the supplies of specie in Italy varied from region to region, city to city, becoming tightest in small, less commercial centers. Bologna's frequent wars with the papacy and the Visconti brought complaints about shortages of specie in 1351, 1353, 1360, 1364, and for the rest of the century. You get the idea. The War of Eight Saints from 1375 to 1378, pitting the papacy against Florence, Milan, and much of central Italy, set off noteworthy shortages in Perugia and Siena, while the subsequent Genoese-Venetian War of Chioggia from 1378 to 1381, closed eastern trade routes affecting money supply throughout Italy. The combined effects of continuous civil war and the great schism in the Kingdom of Naples caused profound shortages of money such that the French Pope, and this is in the Chronicles, um, Clement VII instructed his military captain, Otto of Brunswick, in 1387 to take gold and silver from monasteries and churches belonging to the Italian Pope, Urban VI, in the kingdom to pay his soldiers. To alleviate the strain, states resorted to payments in kind to meet their obligations to soldiers. The practice is well documented. In 1370, Siena sent 2,000 florins worth of horses to pay for a band of soldiers. During the War of Chioggia, the Venetians, the rich Venetians, even paid soldiers' wages in grain. The most common practice, and we heard a lot about this in other contexts, was compensation in cloth, which could easily be transported uh, by soldiers which already functioned more broadly as a means of exchange in inter international trade, including between Venetians and the Mongols. The city of Lucca paid the uh, captain Alberigo di da, da Barbia, da Barbiano 4,000 florins owed him in 1383 in expensive wool cloth, and half of the salary of Braccio da Montone, a nefarious character, were paid in silk cloth. Michael Mallet has shown that compensation in cloth became part of the formal contracts between soldier and employer in the 15th century, in 15th century Venice. Uh, King Alfonso of Aragon, lacking specie for his war in Naples from 1420 to 1458, paid advance loans, imprestanze, uh, they're called, to his soldiers in a fixed ratio of coin and cloth. Soldiers also received land in lieu of specie. The papacy, perpetually short of funds, was a leader in this type of compensation in the 14th century. During the War of Eight Saints, and this is interesting, uh, the papacy gave its ally, Galeotto Malatesta of Rimini, the town of San Sepulcro. He gave his captain of war, John Hawkwood, the towns of Cotignola and Banya Cavallo, and he bestowed a benefice in the English church on the illegitimate son of Hawkwood's co-captain, John Thornberry. The benefice in 1377 is historically significant because it had been promised to the church reformer, John Wycliffe, and Wycliffe's bitter disappointment constituted an important moment in his alienation from the established church. Queen Giovanna of Naples, likewise bestowed land upon her mili military captains in lieu of specie. The most egregious example is that of Niccolò Acciaioli, who served as Seneschal Florentine, the Florentine, uh, who received lands throughout southern Italy from Calabria to Puglia, um, but also lands also in the Greek Peloponnesus. He had quite extensive holdings in the Peloponnesus. The recourse to land should not however, be confused with any broader process of reinfudation or return to land and turn from commerce. It's somehow been identified by some scholars. In Trecento, Italy, grants of land for military service were decidedly ad hoc. 
They included the pawning by state officials of subject lands to individuals in return for short-term infusions of cash, and outright sale of land to third-party outsiders. The reality of Trecento War is that most transfers of land occurred not as the result of capture by enemy armies, but by sales by states seeking money to prosecute war. Queen Giovanna of Naples sold Avignon to Pope Clement VI in 1348 for 80,000 florins explicitly to pay for soldiers who defended the Reino against the Hungarian invasion. Um, two years later, later, her relative Robert of Taranto um, sold Achaia to uh, Venice for 66,000 florins to help raise money for ransoms of hostages taken during the war. There are many, many additional examples of this. Um, conspicuously absent from the studies of Trecento War is consideration of the use of paper instruments and to move funds, extend the money supply, and compensate soldiers. As previously noted, the association of war with mercenaries, mercenaries with greed for gold, has limited such discussions despite the fact that Italy, owing to its international merchant banking sector, was a leader in the use of the Bill of Exchange and paper instruments. Peter Spufford, in his influential Money and Its Uses in, the, in Medieval Europe, and I don't know if another book has been written about this subject, um, stressed the importance of the Bill of Exchange for transferring funds for the papacy to avoid dangerous and uncertain shipment of specie. But he specifically argued against the use of a bill of exchange relating to war, which he claimed involved sums that were too large for the commercial system. The assessment to me is curious because Spufford uses only one example, and that lone example is a citation from the Florentine chronicler Giovanni Villani of a shipment of species in 1328. And if one reads on, that shipment was stolen. Um, so the transfer of funds during war was, in fact, riskier than in times of peace, and the distinction between ecclesiastical and secular transfer of funds is, in any case, ahistorical. Funds transferred by merchant banks for the papacy throughout Europe were used for both military and pacific purposes. The, crusade, excuse me, the crusading movement remained operative in the Trecento, and it applied also to Christian enemies of the Pope, notably the Visconti of Milan. Wars required large, safe transfer of funds. To oppose the territorial ambitions of Archbishop Giovanni Visconti in Bologna and Romagna uh, in 1350 and 1351, the Pope transferred money to Italy by bills of exchange drawn on several merchant banks, including the Alberti Antichi, the Alberti Nuovi, the Rinocini, the Davizi firms, and the Guinigi, uh, Guinigi firm uh, of Luca. Uh, an extant Alberti Nuovi accounts show that payments to soldiers were affected in part by letters of payment, uh, paper instruments, brought by courier and redeemed at the Alberti branch in Naples. Given the relative paucity of surviv surviving account books for our period, it is difficult to make comprehensive judgments. But ambassadorial dispatches survive in copious numbers and serve as a useful, if underemployed, source of what was happening on the ground. They show clearly that bills of exchange were used directly to pay soldiers. A dispatch from the Sienese Archive, July 1381, sent by the city to its envoy named Mino, um, he, tasked with paying a military captain, shows that the city fulfilled 1,500 florins of its 4,000 florin debt with six lettere di cambio. Um, the text of the dispatch, which is in my formal paper, or at least my provisional uh, formal paper, uh, shows that Siena required a receipt from the soldier to complete the transaction, is very legal. Um, the precise nature of the bill is unclear. The dispatch implies that some of them originated with the state, some of them seem to have originated with the ambassador Mino. No bank is mentioned, but the dispatch does note that the bills were paid at usance. 
in this case two days, and it raised concerns with the CNEs who wanted to pay the captain immediately. It is thus likely that the bills were drawn from bankers, redeemed at a bank, and likely functioned, whether formally endorsed or not, as a species of check. They satisfied a debt. They did not serve merely as a credit instrument for speculation in the international money market, as Raymond DeRover's classic carefully diagrammed, much copied, much cited bill from the 15th century that involved two international banks and four interrelated parties. This is different. Um, the city of Siena was here responsible for payment, oversaw the transaction, which probably entailed paying uh, the bankers for the service, a conclusion strengthened by archival evidence from communal budgets that shows that the city paid bankers a fee for exchanges done by them, although it's not entirely clear what the term cambio, which is very ambiguous, uh, means in the account books, whether it refers to the bill or it refers to manual exchanges of coins. Anyway, as I start toward concluding, um, the ambassadorial letters reveal numerous additional examples of the use of bills of exchange, many, many examples. I just give uh, a, a Lucchese dispatch from 1371 instructed representatives in the city of Genoa to pay 500 florins to Genoese cross bowmans in bills of exchange drawn on a bank in Lucca. In this instance, the bank is mentioned. The city was responsible again for the transaction. And a decade later, Lucchese dispatches show that English soldiers received bills, received bills of exchange directly from Alderigo Antel Minelli that went unpaid for which the soldiers held the city of Lucca responsible. The involvement of Antel Minelli is noteworthy here because he was an exile who possessed great wealth from iron and silver mines and his involvement in the lucrative Lucchese trade network in Bruges and London, but who had forcibly attempted to seize Lucca for himself in 1369 alongside those same English soldiers. What's clear is that there is a close relationship between exiles and soldiers, and that this relationship was financial in certain ways. Antimanelli shows that the two excuse me, did business together. One soldier claimed a debt of 7,000 florins. Another claimed to have received a bill of exchange from Alderigo, quote, written in Alderigo's own hand at the town of Città di Castello. Um, the soldier sought restitution directly from Luca. Prolonged negotiations followed, which were formal and legal in nature. Lucchese officials required that the men produce documentation of the transaction. Um, and the English soldiers sought not only the value of the unpaid bill of exchange, but also interest in damages. It was interesting. Um, the evidence supports recent revisionist scholarship that has stressed the flexibility of the bill of exchange and of paper instruments more generally in a non-military context. The revision is important given the extensive concurrent scholarly attention given to the bill in its role as a credit instrument used to play the international money market, a subject with modern day parallels and utility for comparing the past and the present. Medieval terminology was, however, never exact, and scholarly attempts at precise definition reflect modernist realities that do not readily map onto the distant past, in my opinion. Um, as M.M. M. Poston argued all the way back in 1930, the distinction between a bill of exchange, a promissory note, and a letter of payment was not at all clear in its day. The interpretation finds support in the work of the French economic historian Jean Favier, um, writing from the perspective of the French papacy during the Great Schism, who described the bill of exchange as indistinguishable from a letter of credit. And Yves, Ren and Yves Renoir, uh, who showed that the bill of exchange, the promissory notes, were, quote, for a long time referred indifferently under the names of letters of payment, and that the distinction, the distinct term bill of exchange, did not emerge clearly 
with its current meaning until the 15th century, Renoir added that whether the bill of exchange was created by the companies, banking companies, or drawn on them, they allowed others to obtain compensation without the transport of money. If the precise nature of the bills in Trecento, Italy is not clear, their broad use, I hope, is evident. Lucchese archival sources show that bills of exchange drawn on the Guinigi Bank were used to send the profits of war of English soldiers back home for investment. The bills were sent via the Guinigi representative Francesco Vinciguerra of London, as he's called in the sources, um, who was part of the Lucchese merchant community in Bruges connected to, to London. Soldiers' money was went to their relatives, or so-called fee-fees, who then served as beneficiaries and bought land in the name of the soldiers from money that was, they earned in Italy. In his study of German captains in Trecento, Italy, Stefan Zelser uh, argued that the men physically brought their earnings home, citing the proximity and the relative lack of banking activity in German lands. Nevertheless, Zelser notes payments uh, and transfers made through the Milanese del Maino Bank in the city of Ulm and transfers of funds by the Italian uh, Pope Urban VI from the Diocese of Cologne and Salzburg to pay German soldiers. So there's these transfers. The evidence from the 15th century is still more compelling and it is a statement of the unfortunate scholarly status quo that the materials remain not only unintegrated with those of the Trecento, but with monetary history more generally. In a little-sided but important study, at least in the Anglophone world, on the Milanese army under Muzio Attendoli uh, Sforza, Peter Blastenbrei noted, in the absence of specie, soldiers in his band received payment in kind, as well as bills as exchange, promissory notes, and orders of payment. And Alan Ryder's study of Aragonese finance during Alfonso's wars in the Kingdom of Naples, notes profound shortages of specie that required payments to soldiers in cloth purchased primarily from Florentine merchants in return for bills of exchange. And Ryder refers to this as a radical new technique of finance derived from dire necessity. But as the foregoing discussion suggests, the, te the technique was not radical but had deep roots. King Alfonso drew bills on commercial centers such as Valencia, Barcelona, and Palermo. The bills were sometimes underwritten by prominent government officials or people with money. To conclude, there is a need to better, the, the, the need to better integrate studies of war with studies of money and alternative currencies is manifest. The bill of exchange in its various forms was used in the Trecento in Trecento, Italy, and Spufford notwithstanding, used to transfer funds relating to war. The degree to which this was done awaits further research, but given the enormous expenditure attendant warfare, we may rightly imagine that the sums were significant. The bill represented a value that, accompanied perhaps by verbal or written orders clarifying its use, helped expand money supply and had the advantage that the soldier alone or his representative redeemed the bill, making it function, whatever the details, like a check and thus safe from theft by another soldier, which was an occupational hazard. Um, our examples suggest, however, that the bills of exchange were an unpopular expedient used in cases of serious lack of funds and often protested by the soldiers to city authorities. Species rem specie remained the preferred means of making military payments, um, and payments in kind uh, were popular as well. But in, and it was the ability of states like Florence and the Trecento, through institutions like the public debt, outside investment, and an international merchant networks, to amass the wealth that allowed it to achieve military and political hegemony over its cash-strapped neighbors. But payments by bill, promissory note, letter of payment should be understood as part of a widespread use of paper instruments in war and extensive paper trail 
whose precise function in Tres Cento Italy requires further study. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for showing us, I mean, I think one of the most important um, messages here is integrating economic history and military history. That point is well taken, but also for showing how um, Italian city-states like Florence paid soldiers in kind and the flexibility of the bill exchange. So I think we have many uh, fruitful avenues of discussion. Our second speaker is uh, Corinne Matt, Chancellor Marm, and she will um, take the floor. She has a PowerPoint. Grazie mille, dunque, siccome il francese sta diventando una lingua rara come l'italiano, ho cercato di, visto che siamo in Italia, parlerò in italiano. Scusate se faccio qualche sbaglio, ovviamente, e se ci sono anche nel, nel testo scritto in cui eh, i panni sono diventati son diventate lenzuola, ma insomma... Mi perdonerete, spero. E siccome ho mandato abbastanza tardi la relazione riassunta della relazione ai traduttori, ho fatto anche il PowerPoint in inglese, anche lì magari ci saranno qualche sbaglio. Dunque, rispetto alla, alla comunicazione precedente, torniamo in tempi di pace, qualche secolo dopo, e con altri tipi di, di, di operai, anche se anche i soldati possono essere considerati come lavoratori, ovviamente. E, dunque, se ho, se, ho, se ho scelto questo titolo, forse è un po' enigmatico, ovviamente è un po' per gioco, un po' in riferimento al film di Ken Loach, ma... Uh, and also to say, to, to say that the part of the uh, workers, so the part of the remuneration in kind, as always, um, the one that disappeared in the studies of the historians. Above all, above all, for all those historians, uh, that have been very careful to reconstruct uh, the history over many centuries as to salaries and wages, as to the payment in, in, in cash. And this, as uh, has been already uh, said by Luca and Giulio, so annual wages, so this new definition, annual wages, and also I believe we have to get out of these uh, uh, abstraction where this long series of salaries, so, so forgetting these and going back to, 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 to start and thinking of these in a different way. Now I want to stress above all, but this has been already said many times in these days, I want to say that the part in kind of workers' remuneration of the ancien regime was not uh, a palliation palliative to the absence or, I mean, the shortage of money, as this was the case for uh, soldiers in general. But this was also true for the ancien regime, so true in, in, in towns and in, at the countryside, as this has been said by many others before me. And this is very important to stress, uh, and we have to, to study this over these study days. So up to now, this part in kind of remuneration, how was it, how was it paid? You know? how, how did we study this part? So we had a normal form of uh, remuneration in case of apprentices and ser servants as members of the household, uh, and more or less, it was quite usual they could uh, receive uh, a lodging, uh, clothes, and also laundry, food, in different forms and ways, which are not often very well studied or described. And second, this was judged as this, a deteriorated form of remuneration, integrating the interplay of value of products. And this was, was, um, was mentioned as a truck system in the 80s or 70s, a truck system that was then forbidden in many regions. I want to uh, recall the longer duration of this phenomenon. 
the le, from Valerie in 1887. So the in-kind remuneration was forbidden in the Valerie region in Belgium since 1887. I think that we have to study again all this, being more focused on this. And for this reason, I, I tried to I try to to study three uh, uh, three study cases that I studied in the past, just to see the importance, the value of the payment in kind, and comparing this with the payment in money in cash, if it exists, trying to set the grounds of a final discussion of these three cases, study cases. And I want to show you the diversity of the, uh, the components of the payment in kind, the diverse uh, workers that could be paid one part in kind, one part in money, and also the diversity of the economic Economic meanings, but also symbolic meanings. We already said of this. So the, sim the symbolic part of in-kind payments. So the study is 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 a bit fragmented, but I can this can fuel our discussion. So the first study case. Is the one of the of the uh, uh, Fitzy Gallery of the Medici uh, family? You know the Medici family. So this gallery was built up for the government, but also this uh, becomes uh, something new in 1588. This is a gallery of artisan workshops. So a court workshops working for the Grand Duke of Tuscany, with the multitude of of specialties done, wood carvings, uh, sculptures, uh, gold uh, smithery, uh, 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 precious stone carving. So a full set of workshops. So many workers coming to Florence from Milan. They made watches and old weapons. So this gallery has been organized in a very hierarchical way. So at the very first level, you have the uh, workshop masters and an additional hierarchy. I don't want to dwell upon for reason of time now. And also, these, these um, um, produce some accounts being or, or lodgers. Uh, um, so since uh, uh, 1588 uh, up to 1737, these accounts have not been widely studied, but very sporadically by the uh, art historians. What's striking, starting from 604, also we have some uh, I mean, list of those workers working at the, the Medici chapels at the Chapel of the Princes. This register. These uh, these uh, uh, accounts uh, listing people working in different places, uh, but under I mean the uh, control of the same uh, prince, and this gives us the chance to see a huge diversity of people, of uh, people I mean hired, of staff hired, and to say this in a nutshell, we 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 start from slaves up to architects, very famous, notorious uh, artists like the Bontalenti, a famous artist. You see the portrait of this artist, Bontalenti. What I want to tell you, even though I studied the part in cash of this remuneration, we have now to focus on the, on the payment in kind. Just to tell you, this also encompasses a quite huge amount of workers, because even though I, I made some, I take some samples, between these registers, you see the amount of workers can be very high, a huge deal, a huge amount of workers involved. So those being uh, pay, paid in kind is quite normal, being slaves. Slaves are always paid in, in kind to slaves in 1596 And in 60879, 70 slaves then disappear, but the trend is not very linear. So they carry out different activities. Uh, they cut stones, 
at the fortress in Florence, but also they are the keepers of stables, horses, small manual work in workshops. That's what slaves were during those times. Uh, we have different forms of expenditures in kind. This was not real remuneration, but the cost of their living, of their survival, their fed, their lodge, let's say, in the fortress on straw mattresses, and also they are just dressed to receive clothes. But it's so important that in 1598, the amount of expenditures registered for them was 16 uh, soldi and 8 uh, dinners per day. Uh, and two interesting things. This is much higher than the amount recorded for the least paid as to free workers, 6.8 sous, and to the total amount of, of their uh, um, cost of living. That has been, I uh, mean, valued to five uh, sous, almost 11 sous, that might correspond to a form of remuneration, which seems quite uh, um, intriguing to stress this. So a slave just uh, fed, but also they could receive some, some form of remuneration or just fed slaves. For the others, what are to say? What are the different forms of remuneration in in kind for? I mean, artisans, uh, chiselers, or masons, builders being reported in these registers. I mean, no distinction between these artists and all workers. Of course, uh, also we speak of annual donations to give by the Grand Duke at St. John's Feast. So, I mean, downtown. There were some celebrations, and some chattels and properties were 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 given as a gift uh, by the Grand Duke for the celebration, for the for the uh, for the um, um, holiday, for the feast. We have a twenty workshop masters being entitled to receive these donations and these uh, uh, gifts, and then one workshop uh, help those being the slaver keeper or guardians. And also, we have some gifts that can be distributed and it out for a, a good uh, uh, Grand Duke's hunt. We have just uh, as a gift a, a wild uh, boar. So that's very important, this gift, a wild boar, you know, to the Grand Duke. And also have to stress what, 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 what's important the symbolic nature of this gift, this gift. So, so, okay, they have more meat to eat, the wild boar uh, uh, meat, but that's a way of recognition by the Grand Duke to them all. So, in the Fitzy Gallery also, also we have a, a sort of cave, a sort of little kitchen and since uh, things are quite nearby, I thought the artisans of the workshops were allowed to this cave, were allowed in into the cave, into this kitchen, which is not true. Just one was allowed in, just one in the least, the Paolo Bancelli, being a watchmaker, which was uh, who was allowed with his assistant, but in 1590 to reduce the cost. Uh, he, he received just some money. I said that the symbolic value of the gift in kind. So benefiting from the canteen, that's much higher than the remuneration in cash. Well, if we take a quick look at the uh, the accounts of the court, we do see that a certain amount of these of these workshop masters, they were also allowed to the court. They were recruited into the court. And so they received also as other people of the court, in addition to the pay in, in, in cash for their services, for their job, they also received some additional things. And you see the one who was, uh, you see what was given to Bontalenti, bread, oil, wine, salt, vinegar. This was given to Bontalenti candles also, uh, so fire, uh, firewood, and also the free lodging. Free house. 
if we drilling. So you see, finally, if we scroll down this list, we have a smaller amount than I thought this to be at the very beginning of these workshop masters. Really, they are fed. They, they, they are given food, stuff to eat, and many other uh, stuff. A higher amount is also lodged. You have the house, and also they receive a house and a bed. As you see <coughs> in John Falke, a Swedish a jewel maker, that in 1718 wanted to have just uh, to receive a free board and lodging. That's what he was given, free board and lodging, and you have a higher amount of uh, artisans. Having this form of uh, remuneration in, in kind. And they don't think they're just working to receive uh, uh, board and lodging. But board and lodging is, is something plus uh, versus, versus what they receive in cash. Just a few can be lodged in the play, uh, on the place in the gallery. Other can be m most of them. They can be. They can receive the lodging free, paid by the Grand Duke. And the third form is. Um, I mean, they can be paid directly by the Grand Duke, uh, and they 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 will find a possible lodging whenever they, uh, wherever they want. And so we have a different degree of consideration of this. Well, and finally, if we look at all these, uh, just a few who can benefit from all these um, uh, benefits and they try to speed it up because time seems to be quite short and many pages to get through. So, I mean, okay, okay, I was making this, in this reflection, you will tell me what you think of this. The funny slaves are totally lodged, so dressed, fed, etc. And so, I mean, the, the, this is important in the artisan basket. And also we have to consider the economic and symbolic value of, of, of the, of the uh, uh, commodities. We, we, when we say payment in kind, we have to specify what we are referring to, what we mean um, by that. Last but not least in this gallery, which is very interesting to me, even though it's just a single clue, but I believe one part of the remuneration in kind we didn't talk of till now, which is very important instead in the ancien regime economy, is the possibility of, of, of recovering pedal, one part of the raw material. So they crash, uh, uh, they crash, they crash this. Uh, and we have some complex to understand what wastes are. And this can be used many, many, many times. I said this because a young French scholar studying this about the use of pedal in the textile industry, the use, the, the use of pedal, the way of pedal crusher. This is a Swedish jewel maker asking for 2% of the gold he works. And as the Lord said, um, so um, this was the past. There is a sort of, I mean, of, uh, of a custom. So it's it's a custom, you know. That's a tradition. That's a tradition, even though quite quite short. So a quite short, not long dated tradition. Reusing this this matter. Why? this material, maybe for for his personal use, because it's going to do to make other jewels, even though usually he should just work uh, making jewels just for the Grand Duke on a sole basis. So, well, the second case, no, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting lost. So I, I want to speed up, speed up, um, I mean, faster than my slide. I took two example to see, to see I made two examples to try and calculate the amount of the part in kind, the part in cash for these two uh, uh, craftsmen. Cristofano Garufi, the first example, 10% of what he received in money, in cash, more. They pay their house, maybe they paid something more. I didn't see a buon talento, the second craftsman. 
and E received more than half more versus E's um, uh, basic remuneration, receiving this more than half in kind. So if we forget this part in kind, so the, the, the value in money of wages is really pointless. It's really pointless. Well, and the second example and the second study case, the glassmakers uh, that I previously studied, glassmakers uh, making glass in the Venetian style. And then now you see some example on the left hand side of this slide is glass makers. They go everywhere in Europe, making glass everywhere in Europe at the Venetian style. They come from Venice. They wouldn't have uh, the right to leave the city, but they, they left all the time. And then they went to a small Ligurian uh, village making glass in this small Ligurian village. They just spread it all through Europe. They're going everywhere. There's the last uh, uh, map, not so beautiful as the two previous ones, but they're spreading all through Europe, everywhere. They're moving to France, Spain, UK, England, in lower countries, uh, so, so in a very broader sense. And so, and and these uh, glass makers, they work in teams, uh, teamwork. So teams uh, uh, live in Venice, uh, 20 people in the same team, but 12 for uh, working at the, at the furnace. But I also saw some work agreements, and the work agreements were individual work agreements. One work agreement for each of these uh, glass makers. So there is a certain amount of notorial deeds uh, witnessing all this, describing the work that some glass makers will be doing abroad, uh, outside Altale, outside uh, Venice. The other work agreements uh, are oral. Uh, we have no, 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 no. I mean, no trace of this. That's a new situation. So we have these work agreements. We have these notorial deeds. Always consider one part in cash and one part in kind. And the part in kind, and lodging, board and lodging. That that what this was. That that what this was. Sometimes we speak of clogs. Um, I mean, shoes and clothes, clothing. So very, very, very decent clothing, decent. So the issue of quality seems to matter a great deal. So we speak of decent clothing. This must be connected with the status of several uh, workers working around the furnace for, for uh, baking glass. No just for apprentices, but for anyone, masters, helps, and apprentices. And this time, I can tell you that the monetarized salary is a surplus because living, so the survival, is guaranteed by the owners of the furnaces that give them all board and lodging and clothing. And the part in money is that, uh, I mean, surplus. We're going to see in the, in the context of the 18th century. If we consider just the part in money, we lose a lot. Well, the second place, one of the places that go to work is in Liège, in Belgium. And in Liège, in Belgium, we have 100 of work agreements for Italian glassmakers in the 17th century with the local family, Bonhomme, name of this local family, Bonhomme. So their part of remuneration in cash is very big. It's very, it's very large, a huge deal for very skilled workers. But also we have one part in kind, which is always, uh, I mean, board and lodgings, clothing, we, we share in the kitchen and in Liège, also they have, they must have also, I mean, a housemaid. And linen must be uh, provided uh, uh, to them. They should be given linen according to their uh, status, social status. Well, in the edge work agreements also quite often, we see a remuneration in kind for other kinds or groups of workers, uh, like paper makers and whatever. 
and then leave this out. Finally, I'm going to speak of the third st study case, the departure industry, for which I've been working when I was very young, quite young. So, so as, as you know, I went through the medieval ages for wool industry. And then in Prato, they started to make low, medium quality products. Prato does the conserving and the or preserving the privilege of having a guild, uh, also determining the forms of remuneration of all textile workers. And what seems to be interesting in the Prato case, and you didn't see in other French cases, uh, so the same guild. The new status of 1542. Okay, we, we, we read that all workers can be can be remunerated, uh, paid in kind, as this is the custom today, they wrote, whereas in many uh, industries, textile industry in Europe, this is totally banned. It is totally forbidden. So the statue uh, forbids payments in kind, and people are paid in kind all the same. But this is not a stuff, you know, this is not a story. And this, this payment in kind is always uh, uh, used in the 18th century because in many surveys or research, you see that we have a lot paid in kind and just little paid in cash. This is fully recognized by the guild, but that's a sort of fair exchange. So the part in kind is is fair so vis-a-vis -vis the market value. And of course, this is not done by the wool makers because anyone is complaining. We have a lot of complaints. Oh, oh, oh the spinners are complaining. There's a spinning silk or a uh, uh, hemp. They are paid in, in, uh, in nature, uh, value too much, which does not correspond to real value of this. Uh, and also the municipality, the city of Prato, uh, says the workers, uh, they do not even receive this part of payment in, 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 in kind. So there is a sort of or excessive value of this part in kind, which does not correspond to real value of the commodities in the, in the marketplace. This is quite common in all textile centers in Europe. Workers are paid in kind. That's a way of domination, of dominating these people, of imposing this to workers, thus under, 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 underpaying these people. And so, so, and also work, uh, work by piece is well, is badly done. And also we have some report that wool has been stolen. What should be interesting to investigate all the secrets, uh, all the second secrets that originate for, for, from this. If, if you receive an entire drape, you will receive this drape for you and for your family. And you can also resell this drape. But to go straight to my conclusion, to finish this off now, well, the conclusions. Uh, so in order to, to, um, to, um, to answer some questions, I want to say that in the case I study, the remuneration in kind is not linked with the special economic crisis, you know, because this is done in the long run. So in contest, this was a sort of customary, customary uh, uh, practice, a usual custom. We can also read about in work agreements. Uh, it's not the case, in my view, either, that there is a sort of link with the duration of the uh, work relationship. Uh, as we have seen, it's very interesting to see the huge range of benefits, as Luca said and Giulio said, so a wide range of workers that can be paid this way, artists, slaves, masters, so super skilled in glass making and also spinners, um, spinners, 
so working at the Prato families location. But the symbolic value of the part given in kind is much different for one and other and the other category. To try to to give some estimates, okay, from the examples I've been sharing, from a minimum of five, eight percent of the value of the monetary remuneration up to more than 50 percent. Now, that's a very narrow part. So, and also, and of course, to go beyond, this does not stop with the Ancien Regime, but we see this continuation of payment in, in, in kind in several European industries in the 19th and 20th century, up to the current practices or customs now of corporate cars, uh, uh, lodging, whatever. And then I also mention, I also mention the papagallo, la perruque in French. This work made like parrot. This is a work made with the raw materials of the enterprise, of the undertaking, with the tools of the undertaking enterprise. And we have many papers of contemporary scholars on this parrot, peruque, papagallo practice. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much for uh, that comparative analysis, which I think really helps to highlight the similarities and the differences, and particularly lends strength to your conclusions about things like the persistence of payments in kind, but also especially the way in which um, these payment methods really didn't seem to acknowledge, acknowledge differences in social classes. It was across the spectrum, the social spectrum. Uh, our third paper is by oh, um, Judike Petrovist of Paris. Merci beaucoup. Le 2 février 1264, les consuls. On February the second, uh, until to, uh, 1273, we have, um, we see both uh, uh, money obtained and spent uh, with a set of objects, uh, many, many kinds of objects, uh, giving rise to a list. Uh, as you see here on the screen, uh, where we have a set of objects uh, tool and tools uh, dealing with construction site, uh, the parish uh, church. Uh, we have hammers, we have iron, uh, and different elements. Uh, these objects uh, remind us uh, that uh, throughout the mandate, uh, consuls uh, would have uh, to preserve uh, a large set of commodities, uh, some of them be connected with local autonomy, like uh, the pot. Un usage strictement économique, comme ces vêtements. Others had a different use, some an economic use like garments or blankets that would provide some debt that had been made to the municipality. These resources for Najak Consulate. La liste de ces biens laissés en dépôt par les particuliers, mais aussi leur devenir. Elle permet d'après. We have this kind of list made by private. This allows to learn what was being done at a municipal level, and you see that the object has some peculiar value. And we know that, uh, for example, the, we can have a deferred payment of without using money. The object can be considered as uh, an alternative currency. Burkastral, de quelques centaines de feux, situé en. So we have a few hundreds of uh, uh, feudal property or the business, uh, we have the fortress, uh, and uh, we have uh, 
a very large church in the same period. This monumental uh, building uh, showed the upheaval of the population against Alphonse de Poitiers that uh, was obtaining rights from a nobleman in Toulouse. Uh, the count had this fortress built to control the inhabitants very much, were very close to other noblemen. And in order for this upheaval to be finished, he decided to pay for a new parish church that would host the whole population of the church that we see in order to provide on April the 21st, 1249, some tax, some local tax was levied. This direct enregistré chaque année les sommes perçues des contribuables with some direct collection and every year there was a list of the money perceived by taxpayers and the different uh, uh, taxes and the money spent uh, in order for this church to be built. Uh, this uh, fiscal system uh, starts uh, uh, showing some, uh, some lists uh, of objects uh, and the people who can pay for their taxes. Uh, these uh, lists uh, have to be separate. Uh, at the end of the year, the consuls, uh, the outgoing consuls, uh, uh, provide a list of the object uh, given by taxpayers that they didn't manage to pay uh, taxes throughout the year. There is a list of commodities or goods left as a pawn. Uh, the second kind of a list uh, at the beginning of the next coming year, consuls provide a list of the debt uh, which has been recovered by consuls uh, following. Uh, uh, the payment of, uh, uh, of uh, taxpayers and others that can be recovered later following uh, uh, the selling of the pawn. Uh, therefore, some dialogue starts between the two kinds of lists. Uh, the first uh, commodities as a pawn and uh, the, at the end of uh, one account a year, we see the second list uh, when uh, the next coming year is being settled. So the intersection of these lists uh, allows us to follow uh, what, how commodities were, were moving, starting from the deposit at the consulate uh, until uh, it was given back to the owner. Therefore, the time uh, it allows us to show some effective controlling instrument in the hands of the consul although there is a certain number of limitations supposed. First of all, the list, the second kind of list, debt recovery, requires to be better explained. It does not say whether the money that was taken to pay for this debt is the, or not the result of a debt which was based on a commodity given as a pawn or a debt that was paid in money with money in money therefore this this difference was not explained the second point is the dialogue between the two lists which is not perfect because there is no more tra tracing of pawns being sold in the same kind of list and de Najac s'avérait régulièrement in the same way the consul himself cannot say uh, who this pawn belongs to, a pawn that had been uh, uh, sold. Some of the pawns uh, were sold, and they didn't know who they were belonging to. It also reports uh, uh, a very complicated system between uh, 1258 and 1273. We have at least uh, 743 objects uh, which have been given uh, by, to the council by taxpayers. Uh, therefore, you, you we can easily imagine how difficult it was for consuls to manage a set of different objects uh, preserved uh, uh, for several years, uh, waiting for the payment of a fiscal debt. Therefore, in nearby city, Villeneuve, uh, 1301, uh, consuls uh, 
are uh, settling, asking to, to to pay for all the commodities left as a pawn before the, their successor in order for this problem to be fixed or solved. The management of objects given to the council to settle fiscal debts can be heavy for local authorities when this practice only represented a small amount of taxpayers. And this can be seen between 12, 1258 and 1273. We have more than 37 uh, sub people using uh, the deposit of an object, of an object, uh, and this uh, comes uh, from uh, the the, the uh, heads of, of the families. Uh, this shows the marginal uh, result of objects uh, set as a pawn. Therefore, uh, uh, examining uh, the figures in 1261, for example. We can uh, see that in 1261 we have the overall income uh, was 205 900 dinners. 218 ont été perçus dans l'année, soit 96,7%. Dinners, uh, and then some of this money was obtained throughout the year, but 6,611 are still to be recovered at the end of the year. Therefore, uh, by 139 private people, and these 139 uh, people, 131 have been registered for a debt which is not guaranteed uh, uh, by the payment of the object. And this represents uh, 6,400 dinners. Uh, in 1261, uh, those are living an object as a pawn to guarantee their debt, uh, they represent 666 dinners. Therefore, they use. Uh, the use of confiscation or seizure, and we have a seizure which shows some debt which is not represented 0.3 percent of expected income. We see this kind of activity. Uh, and we see also, we also see that uh, in southern Toulouse, for example, we have in Toulouse too, which is a large city already with a monetized economy, we see that people are still living commodities as a pawn. Okay, this uh, persistence uh, and this activity shows that at least uh, for part of the population of the region, uh, giving back an object was uh, a habit uh, in order for taxes to be paid. Uh, if we consider uh, all these kinds of lists and objects uh, in pawn, uh, also shows uh, the impact of uh, the tax system uh, on the on domestic uh, objects uh, and uh, examining this list allows us to follow uh, this uh, situation 179 objects out of 742 uh, left uh, at this time uh, or given okay we need to distinguish uh, two schemes uh, following this kind of activity. First of all, we have uh, the majority scheme, 87 percent of cases. The second one is the taxpayer not being capable of paying his own tax. Therefore, he gives an object to the consul, and at the end, uh, he will pay this tax uh, redeeming the, uh, the commodity. Therefore, the deposit of an object uh, allows uh, uh, some deferred payment. Therefore, he, ta he's a he takes uh, some time and he can take advantage of this time in order for the uh, objects to be redeemed. For example, we have an example that is reported, you see, in the slide. Uh, he gave uh, some blanket uh, for Sue. And then the next year, recovering four, recovering four sous from the same blanket, and the register says that this blanket has been redeemed. 
Okay, we understand how interesting this solution was in a society where there was this, uh, there was a limited uh, availability. It was a small village, uh, a land, a vineyards, a guide, orchards, and gardens. Therefore, the use of debt would allow them to face uh, uh, the new, the time before the next harvest and the reimbursement of the credit from another subject. This is uh, this object. Uh, uh, given to the consul allows uh, these uh, people to be the uh, to be redeemed by the owner once they had uh, sufficient uh, um, uh, money, which uh, would usually take one year. This is a dominant uh, scheme, but besides this dominant uh, scheme, there is another one, uh, which represents 13 percent of cases. Uh, we see that the commodity given to the consul hasn't been redeemed. It was uh, sold by the consul. Therefore, two possibilities: uh, the consulate. Uh, would uh, ha- would uh, um, uh, could also sell the commodity you see uh, in the bottom part of the slide to the left uh, Pierre Ribeira 1270 de- depositing a commodity to sue and then two years later the consulate receives uh, to sue it's Combelas uh, and for these objects which had been given two years before. In this case, the debtor had paid off his fiscal debt by giving an object, and the reselling of this object by the city would represent this, uh, the transformation of the royal money. The second solution was the consulate that would also be using these commodities according to its needs. In 2005, 2005 uh, the outgoing consul provides a list of 11 objects uh, left by nine privates, uh, up to 30 sous, and uh, informing the successor that uh, there are several commodities, a piece of leather, uh, two bars of iron, and several objects. Uh, and this was, uh, was given to Gambardet to pay, uh, f- to pay his work and mortar on the site, uh, on the working site. Uh, apart from the intrinsic value, this shows that objects would be used uh, as uh, remuneration systems for the consulate replacing currency. In this uh, study, we see some question that still has to be answered. We have seen two ways uh, to pay back a debt. Uh, The debt is just in money, a commodity, to guarantee this debt. The the deposit of a pound to pay for this uh, fiscal debt uh, and the criterion uh, underlining uh, the seizure, this depended uh, on the value of the debt. Uh, The value of the debt guaranteed by the objects uh, was usually higher than the debt, which was not. In 1261, uh, the debt guaranteed uh, by pound represents 9.6 percent of the debt, the value of debt of the year, uh, 5.75 percent. Therefore, the scheme is not very convincing. Or maybe we can think that the use of the deposit of an object may, uh, satisfies both debtors. Therefore, we have personal connect links. But there is an, uh, there is another scheme. For, with the very same person using using the system of seizure or debt, but in the same year, or maybe in the same year, when there are two consecutive uh, uh, debts. Uh, uh, the decision of giving an object to the consul was also part of a strategy of the debtor that was uh, following the uncertainty of the financial assist, uh, implication and this would allow the redemption of the asset of the of the of the commodity this allowed the debt not to find not not to find himself in the position of not paying the debt which would have a consequence on his personal reputation or the use of a credit 
the choice of debts uh, given to municipal authorities uh, was done very carefully. For taxpayers, it meant uh, leaving a commodity as a pawn, uh, but uh, the, its temporary loss uh, was not causing problems for the family. Therefore, the examination of uh, commodities received uh, uh, 12, uh, 58, and 73 in, by, to the consul shows the commodities used as a pawn. And this allows us to better uh, to find uh, 686 objects uh, at that time. Uh, we have uh, 30 objects, uh, including uh, four large categories. Uh, the first includes uh, 80% of the objects left, and uh, this corresponds uh, to a rather low value, lower than the value of commodities in general, hammers and different kinds of tools. And then we have uh, other tools, domestic tools, 25% uh, of, the, of these objects, uh, domestic objects. Okay, this is the first one. As uh, for tools, providing a debt uh, which is lower than average. Okay, we see the so-called deuxième donc type d'objet donc les like melting pots, and then we have other kinds of of uh, buildings uh, and domestic tools. Uh, we have uh, one quarter of them. And then we see some uh, des valeurs, uh, assez faibles. The stoves. And then we see a rather uh, low value apart from uh, this pot that I was mentioning, having a higher value. And then uh, the third family of objects, uh, we have those uh, uh, clothing items, about 15% of the objects uh, left, uh, characterized uh, by a much higher value than the previous objects. With some objects uh, relating to clothing uh, with rather high debt. We see a high percentage of average debt, 87 objects which are globally having a high value. The fourth family of objects deals with textiles for the home. We have blankets, and for each family, they had blankets in the, in the family, in the home that were given as a pawn for debts uh, lower than the value of, uh, of the debt. It is uh, more than uh, twice as much as the complex. And this is the end. The fifth family, intermediate commodities, about 12% of, of these materials. Uh, materials uh, used for the production of other objects. Uh, and usually, their value is much higher than the others. We have pieces of leather to be used with different kinds of leather. We have a simple leather. We have a different kinds of leather. Then we have some important values, iron, furs, they are also are very they are also very important in total we have a set of objects dealing with domestic tools they value would allow to better guarantee the debt but this supposes the problem of the destination of this value and this would be could be a way to adjust this ratio between the debtor and the one receiving the money. Among the different values, among the different commodities, we have some stoves, 48 dinners, then we have cloaks, 
between four to seventy-eight dinners, and then we have a, a variable, uh, a wide range of products. Uh, when consul describe uh, these uh, products, uh, they report uh, the poor condition of the uh, of the commodities given. They may be old, obsolete, uh, damaged. Uh, for example, they were selling a cloak that had long been used uh, with a lower value than the debt. Uh, anyway, the consul can settle this. La mise en place en 1258 d'une fiscalité. Okay, this is the end. We have uh, a regular tax system in uh, Naja uh, contributed to the circulation of commodities in town. Therefore, different uh, families uh, transferred uh, such commodities to the consulate uh, as a pawn for fiscal debt, uh, and part of these objects uh, were be was being settled uh, by the consul. And therefore, we see that uh, debts represent a very important uh, element uh, in uh, uh, Najak family's strategies, which is clear. What was done shows the different economic classifications with different cases observed the use of objects for paying taxes. And it is not specific for poorer classes. Indebtedness caused by the tax could be compensated by the benefits coming from the redistribution of these taxes. For example, in this for example, Kunu giving a, a knife as a pawn to pay these tax of 40 dinners, but this tax since it is, this tax is used to pay to build the church, this tax allowed him to receive 112 dinners as a compensation for the work done. Then again, and more amazing, the use of, of a pawn for Najak debt, 31, 31 uh, taxpayers, they uh, placed the role of a consul from one to four times in this period. Uh, the latter are characterized by the deposit of objects of better quality, re recovering uh, uh, the debt, uh, which is uh, higher than average. Therefore, in this case, uh, it is difficult uh, to see the deposit composant pardon a part entière du capital mobilier du foyer they these objects represent part of uh, of the activities of the family and this was this all was part of the domestic family gage d'un objet permettait de retarder therefore giving an object as a pawn would defer the payment of a tax therefore the object would be could be uh, bought again by the debtor or left as an alternative and be sold by the consul. Thank you. Thank you for this interesting discussion of how this uh, relatively small town handled um, payments in kind for the, from those unable to pay the municipal tax. And I found interesting not only your, the topology of goods that you provided, um, but also that the town could use these goods to pay its own debts, and also in showing that the um, tax, uh, that the debts n did not necessarily, um, were not necessarily a sign of economic distress. We are going to take a 20 minute break, all right, for coffee and reconvene. Please, if you have questions, you will come forward and fill out one of these forms. Would you like to ask? Good. Would you like to ask a question? <laughs> no. No? Bill, do you want to ask me? I'm soliciting questions. <laughs>
domande perché abbiamo tantissime domande e quindi vorrei chiedere alle persone che vogliono porre le domande to keep your answers perhaps short and then uh, you can continue the discussion after uh, the session is over if it goes uh, too long. Uh, Angela, first will be the questions for Bill Caffaro, Angela Orlandi. Bene, eh, ringrazio il professor Caffaro per questo. I wish to thank professor Caffaro. Thank you very much for your contribution using uh, many sources and the use of different uh, sources uh, is the one that can provide uh, some uh, terminology uncertainty in interpreting uh, and in defining uh, terms. Uh, because uh, terminology is uh, crucial, especially when we speak uh, about uh, financial related topics. Uh, we should know exactly what a letter of exchange is, uh, having specific features. Uh, and if it does, it is a letter of exchange. Otherwise, it is not. The letter of exchange as such, uh, and you said it, uh, is a flexible instrument. Uh, it is flexible because it is adapted to a whole set of functions and roles. But it is no longer a letter of exchange. It is a letter of exchange, but rather peculiar, but rather strange. For example, if this monetary difference is missing, it is a fund transfer. And from this viewpoint, money transfer. or money transfer, and there are different uh, studies uh, in Italy that uh, show a very precise uh, classification of the different uh, roles applied the letter of exchange, uh, the so-called uh, peculiar letter of exchange, when uh, the difference of place is missing or subjects uh, coincide. Therefore, maybe having this clear in mind, uh, some of the aspects uh, of your sources uh, might be clearer. The other aspect, the other question, the other thing I'd like to say is the use of letter of exchange to pay the soldiers or the military. But which kind of military? Because it is rather obvious that a letter of exchange was would be used to pay commanders or captains or captains of companies. But I don't know the single which kind of soldier uh, paid uh, with a letter of exchange. Maybe yes. Uh, I have never found any in a study that I did uh, on uh, a company by Micheletto degli Attendoli that uh, took part in Anghiari battle. In that case, uh, Florence uh, paid uh, Micheletto with letter of, ex letter of exchange. But whenever uh, payments had to be made, payments were made uh, by the treasurer of the company in cash. Uh, and of course, there was also payment, uh, pay some payment in kind, but most of the payments were made uh, uh, in cash. And the treasurer had three uh, cases. Uh, were keeping cash for, and uh, on a daily basis, uh, payments were being made. So when were a letter of exchange being used? Maria Fusaro. I don't know whether to ask the question in Italian or in English, but I will stick with English. Uh, mostly because I thought of the question in English and I cannot translate. Um, and that's the beauty of the Latini. And sorry, I know Marianne, sorry. I won't be as fast as I normally am. But I think this is a crucial issue, that of the linguistic approach and the difference in terminology across different national historiographies, across different realities across instrument of legal payments that go across borders and across jurisdictions. So those very flexible friends that I like to quote Francesco on this, that Bill was raising earlier on, 
it strikes me that our necessary and essential precision in creating categories which were fixed at a later period somehow shades and confuses what was a reality which was a lot less fixed and for a purpose. I don't think they were making mistakes when they were being ambiguous. In my experience, they're ambiguous because using one expression as opposed to the other allowed them legal recourse in one jurisdiction as opposed to another one. And once we insert the issue of the conflict in jurisdictions, I think that things change quite a bit. So, two quick questions to build on that. I was very, very happy to hear you talking about the fact that this big bills of exchange, whether formally endorsed or not, operationally were working as checks. Uh, I've seen this for a far later period during the War of Candia, so quite a lot later. I'm very intrigued by this. I want to know more. I want to read the book. Uh, what type of documentary traces you have of this? Enough for some quantitative analysis, albeit not with big numbers. And then a specific question on the Antel Minelli case. Again, I would like to know more about the contact with the local prominent jurist, as you called him. What was the legal point that he was asked to uh, clarify? Thank you. Um, Francie Michel. Well, first, thank you for your three uh, interventions. I learned a great deal, so thank you very much. My question for William is the following. It's a very simple, factual almost. It has to do with your central... Oh, sorry. It has to do... My question has to do with the central case study that you bring up in your paper, the written version. It's John Hawkwood. And it goes to the question of motivation um, behind the various acceptance of um, flexible forms of earnings. So he got cash and gold. He got... Uh, bills of exchange, if I understand, and tracts of land. You said at one point in your paper that these um, lords, these capitani, these uh, war leaders, were not interested in feudal gains necessarily in a traditional sense. Um, can you say something about John Hawkwood? If I would like to know more about his ambi personal ambition. I know you know a great deal more than I do about him. Uh, I just, the only thing I know also is that he ended up in, back in England, I, I, I think. But I'd like to know if there's something to be said about his ambitions uh, and if there is any way to understand the evolution of those ambitions over time as well with respect to what he was expecting to gain for his military services. Thank you. Uh, Corinne? Oui. Um, Yes, I'm going to speak French. I have a question, in line with Angela's question. How much of these alternative currencies have been used? Soldiers, mercenaries, they, they just, uh, um, they were just um, in angry when they were not paid in cash. There was um, a, a rebellion. So maybe we imagine fortune captains uh, will be paid in uh, alternate currencies. But what about foot soldiers? Uh, foot soldiers, how they were paid? With alternative currencies? Robert Braid. Robert Braid. I'll be brief. Uh, great paper. I have uh, two uh, very precise questions. I wanted to know, relative to these bills of exchange, at what point did they receive them? Uh, it, was it in installments, or was it only at the very end of their contract? Because if it's at the very end of their contract, soldiers, they might want to go and consume and, and buy things and go out drinking and, and prostitution was a, was a big consumption of, among 
mercenaries. Uh, and perhaps would these bills of exchange, if they were offered at the end, be a way to limit that type of consumption and control the behavior of the, of the mercenaries? If they have no cash in their pocket, they can't go off and do certain things. That's one. And you said that these have old roots. And I, when you were talking, it reminded me a lot of the Knights Templar and their letters that they gave to the pilgrims right in a, uh, because it was quite dangerous and it wasn't because there was a lack of coin available it was simply because of the dangerous nature of the of the mission and I, I don't know if there's any legal or any if you see any sort of relationship between those two methods of uh, of payment thanks um and yako Yes, uh, my question links up nicely with uh, uh, Robert's first question. It is about the consequences of being paid with uh, paper money. I was thinking as along the same lines, but also wondering to what extent this may have been a way to influence the movement of soldiers and troops, because you're basically forcing them to return to a city or your city. And this can be a good thing or a bad thing. You might be in the opportunity to rehire them. You might also end up with some rowdy soldiers, as, as you already alluded to. So I was just wondering whether control over the movement and mobility of soldiers might have been an issue here. Okay, Bill, the floor is yours. The, the first one about terminology. Can, can you hear me? Can you talk closer to your mic? Closer, please. I need to be closer to the mic, yes. Move it up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. But uh, the question about terminology that, that, that you mentioned, um, uh, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, you know, Francesco's talked about it as a flexible friend. I think the one thing that was clear to me in, in, in what I read was that the um, terminology is, as, as, as uh, Maria mentioned, uh, it seemed almost intentionally vague and unclear. Um, in fact, there's an account book of the Alberti that exists and has been edited by Richard Goldthwaite and others in which there's the movement of coin, and I, I mean there's a movement of money by use of what the introduction calls letters of exchange, but in fact, in the actual uh, account book itself, it's called letters of payment. And I've seen these words. I mean, I didn't use the examples. I have them in my paper, and I will have them in my in, in other paper. Examples taken from ambassadorial letters, and this is where I get the information because we don't have account books for this. The Cavoni account book exists in 1336, and it really doesn't deal with this issue. Florence is uh, at war with, alongside of, of, of Venice. So it just describes them, and, and, I, um, and, I, I, and it describes them openly in several, it uses parallel expressions for these same bills. So um, I, I don't see it in any way as an anomaly in the usage. The thing I think I'm most concerned about is because of Raymond de Rover's great reputation, um, he is, and his precision. People look at the bill of exchange, particularly as it's used in the 14th century now, and that's not a century he was even interested in, to be honest. Uh, and they see it as something that's fixed, and there's this modern terminology about it, and he's, just as he does with double entry bookkeeping, he's very precise, you know? But it, at the time, I don't believe that that was perceived that way. Um, I think it's modern terminology cast into the distant past and that the terminology that was used in the 14th century was different um, because it had different, um, it, it, it was, uh, I saw the bill of exchange as an expedient and you asked also whether you know, it went to the captains, at what level did this go? And frankly, when you study this, it's very hard to find any information about anyone below the level of the top of a captain. So these are going to captains. 
because captains are the ones who are discussed. Now, whether um, somehow they make their way down the chain, I don't know. And when, if, if you ask if it also involves the infantry, the interesting thing about infantry at this time is that while you'll get almost exact accurate figures, and I've checked these over many years, about the cavalry part of an army, you almost, almost invariably, if you read the sources, the, the other part of the army, the, 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 the infantry, which is the larger part, invariably, is called a great mass of men. And this is a social dynamic here. And so what happens with them is something that we know almost nothing about. So um, it, it does happen on the level. It's not just mercenaries. And I would, this is for a discussion of a different time. But I also, I mean, I noticed in some of the questions, this immediate notion that these mercenaries are bad. I would say that the definition of a mercenary needs to be reworked. Uh, because Italy is filled with them, uh, and they become the head of states, <laughs> you know. Um, and the people who come to Italy are, are people who also go on crusades, you know. I mean, except for, say, John Hawkwood, who was mentioned. So, um, and um, I was asked also um, uh, by, by, by Maria about... Um, the narrative and, and sort of the, the, the idea that maybe this is done intentionally to be, uh, and, and I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know if it's done intentionally, but what I do know is that um, there are different, it's not, I mean, the, the, the use of these various terms is not restricted, um, to, I mean, I don't know why it hasn't been brought up enough in the literature, but it's not restricted only to war. The reason why I brought it up with respect to war is because everybody has told me that war and gold go together, especially when you're dealing with mercenaries. They pay higher wages. I could have come here with a wage set, but I didn't want to. Uh, that shows that their salaries, I mentioned this I think earlier, but their salaries actually are either sticky or they start going down. You know, so that the idea that they have this greed for gold, uh, I think there are other forms of in-kind payment that they get, like stealing things, for example. That's part of their, their, um, uh, their, their compensation. So, um, uh, so I, I, I agree with the idea that, that, that it, was, it was probably... Um, and, and the Antimonelli, I think you, you ask about that, and, and, and you know, what was the local prominent jurist? They went to someone from the University of Bologna to discuss this issue, and the issue was whether that bill of exchange that was being contested was valid and whether it had the signature of the person who uh, issued it, it was Antimonelli. And it's very important, I think, because 1369, Florence is at war, with Pisa, and there's an attempt by Antimonelli to take that city. And he's a very wealthy man, and he's doing it alongside of armies. The armies are supposedly Milanese, but he himself is clearly paying them in addition to Milan. And this is a big point for me in my work and in the book that I'm working on, is that beyond the state level, there is an economy of war, which is constant. I mean, and it's very important because people talk about warfare makes states. Or there's a military revolution and then the cannon does everything. And I want to move away from that um, because there's so much more going on. Um, so, um, and um, I, I, I hope that I, I, I answered um, uh, the, the, the question that Robert, I guess, you asked about um, when precisely they were paid this. Um, I can only tell you that my cases, and again, I, these are from ambassadorial dispatches, and, there, and of course thousands of these exist for this period, and so hundreds of examples I can, I can adduce for this, but I can't think of a single example when someone was not paid in bill of exchange because they were not paid in another way. So they weren't necessarily paid at the beginning of a contract or at the end of the contract. The, example that I was give, the examples that I gave were uh, captains demanding to be paid now, probably in cash, and ending up being paid in, in and, and usually it's back wages. 
has been my experience. Um, so and when what they do with their personal lives, again, like I said, one of the curious things about uh, the captains that I've dealt with, whether they're Italian or they're German or they're Hungarian or they're, or, or they're English, they almost all seem to go on crusade. And, and John Hawkwood was asked to go on crusade by Catherine of Siena, and he said no. You know, because that, yeah, that was the thing that was done, you know. So, I mean, as, as people, and I, and I, I um, get to that um, Francine's question about uh, John Hawkwood. Uh, as, uh, I, I wrote a book on John Hawkwood, and I only say I did so because someone told me to. Um, uh, and um, much of the information on this was supposed to be about a book about the economy of warfare, which I'm finally trying to finish. But... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, John Hawkwood is, 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 is a fascinating character. Um, his personal ambition, it's, it's hard. I, I don't know that there's any more famous character in the 14th century who lived in two worlds. That would be the English world. His body, by the way, is in Florence. It's not back in England, even though they asked for it in case. When, he actually did retire in 1381 to become something of a feudal lord. And Burkhardt even alludes to this. as he kind of like a, 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 a new phase, the start of a phase that would, would, would bring Italian mercenaries who become lords of their places. But he was very unsuccessful in 13. Because he found out something very important. If he became a lord, he could be attacked himself, and he could lose money. So he sold his pieces of land in Banja Cavallo, Cotignol, and so on um, to the Malatesta clan. Um, and um, uh, uh, and I, I guess the the final the question. I hope I included also the question that I received uh, from the panel. Uh, I think it's embedded in, in, in what I said. And uh, uh, Jaco, I think you asked about um, uh, the pay to pay, what, when they could redeem them and the forces um, of, that allowed them to return to the city and so on. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I got the whole question. Um, to, I, 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 um, we'll talk. Okay, but but I, I think maybe it's embedded. I just I, again, I guess when it comes to these captains, all we know is in fact that these. All I know is that these captains receive these bills. They receive these bills usually in the, under circumstances that were not pleasant because they were owed money. Um, uh, and I don't know what they did with them, but I do know that bills were used to move their money back home, where John Hawkwood, as an example, became a person who had an enormous landed estate back, back home, which was actually attacked during the Peasants' Revolt. You know, he lost some territory as a result. I mean, it's like, it's, it's an amazing story. But I mean, but in general, uh, you know, these guys, I know that this happens on the upper level, and uh, I, the, the paper originally was supposed to be about Apodice, which is a notarial document that uh, all soldiers got, whether they were actually on the upper level or the lower level, and it was a slip of payment, and I've seen no literature on that whatsoever, and I know one thing is that when Tommaso Zerbi wrote about the Guisano Bank back in the old days, and no one in America refers to that, uh, those soldiers that were Milanese also got this apodice. They gave it back, and they often got less money than they were actually owed. So part of what made me interested in these financial instruments, and I don't really know, I don't have a real answer for what that is, is, is the fact that I think that the state is, 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 is cheating their soldiers to a certain extent by using paper instruments. That was uh, part of it, so um, I've said too much. Thank you. Now we turn to questions for Corinne Matt, Natasha Kokori. Natasha. Alors, je, je, c'est une question sur euh, la grande variété des travailleurs. Euh, donc, c'est le premier cas que j'ai trouvé. The variety of workers. That's a great case. from slaves to artists, uh, well-known payments in kind. You said that these symbolic uh, payments, a way of uh, recognizing someone, a form of recognition. This has been said by many sources. 
we said the quality of products in these days. Maybe sources didn't say that. The quantity, okay. And then I have another, a third issue, third point. As urban historian, is the first time we do this. The office gallery, a building, so for lodging, for lodging. For, this lodging, can you I mean, um, place this lodging inside the building of the office of gallery or outside? And, and we see some symbolism in the location. If it's, I mean, near the Medici's family or far away from the Medici's family, this turns out to be a real uh, symbolic value or element. This was in your, in your conclusion. You said of things uh, uh, been, been, been there even today in the public function industry, also, we have some uh, uh, function uh, lodging ministers and also school professors having just the mean service uh, uh, lodging in schools. So, I mean, the service houses. So, but where these, these I mean, these, these lodging uh, where was provided, so far uh, or near the Medici, the Medici family? Thank you. Maria Fusaro. That's a specific question to the point you stressed. At the end of your communication, of your presentation, where you said that we have many situations in which we have the ban of pain in kind, but uh, now we have a, a remuneration in 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 kind. I want to ask you if if in these uh, specific cases, can you see or is this court looking for some patterns? Some um, uh, schemes to understand. In, and on which situation this might occur. You said you don't see any connection, any link uh, as to the change of payment with the economic crisis, uh, nor with the duration of the working relationship. But in case paying in commodities is uh, in assets is illegal, so maybe it's not worth looking for some links or connections. Are they a, a indigenous workers, uh, so subjects, uh, foreigner workers? Is there some? Uh, they depend on the on the on the on the. On, on, this depends on their status. That's legal, but it happens, but not in ordinary cases, I guess. Robert. Thank you, Karine. I don't know if I understood what you said dur during your presentation. Just a little question. You said we have different times before the evolution over time. Which kind of transformation in the practices? And if there is a transformation, why do we have this, this, this transformation? For, for which reason? Why? Yes, I've been following this, this presentation by Karine. I found this presentation quite radical, maybe the most radical among the ones I've been listening to these days. This presentation so, um, speaks of the crisis, the percentage of, uh, of um, uh, payments in money or payment in kind. So this was quite important, exhausted, and examples you submitted are very well studied. I was just asking myself, uh, what else can you say, you know? Can you also see in the contemporary uh, period, do you see any distinction 
in contemporary period between payment in money and uh, uh, commodity assets. I'm very traditional to this extent. And I see monetary payment uh, as the last form or deed of, of the economy. Always there's been some tension. A tension between uh, commodity assets uh, uh, and payment in, in cash. That's quite um, evident in, in black work. You do see this tension between the uh, formalization of currency, of money, and then the, the real salary. But I wanted to ask you to which extent you go in the nine, there is a sort of formalization in the contemporary period uh, time. If I think of these big soccer, soccer oh, football players, they, they receive benefits, footballers. They are paid very, very well, footballers. They have a flat, and also they receive the, the, the air ticket to fly back home. So we have these fringe benefits even today. So I want to know from you if you see any difference versus the contemporary, our contemporary times period. Thank you for these questions. For Natasha, for lodging, so the problem of, of, of this, uh, the problem is that we cannot see the difference, the different workshops, or so, and that's a real ad, a decade for historians just uh, consulting these registers. They don't know where, where these, um, this, this lodging was provided. But also we know we know that the the only one in the gallery is the minister of the gallery who, who got his lodge in the gallery. He works too much, so he has to leave on the very spot. Proximity with the political power is shown the symbolic status of being lodged in the gallery. For the other people, for the other ones, so we do not have the addresses of the, of the houses they were living in or the apartments they were living in. And we have no news information about the function of service lodging or houses or apartments. School heads were just uh, lodged on the, on, in the school, but not necessarily, not all the times. For the 20th century, I don't know anything else but this. So nothing more about this point. For the, the question about, and the question from Maria, which language shall I speak now? I'm, I'm answering you in Italian, Maria. So in most textile centers in Europe and in the modern period, six, uh, 16th, 17th century. So in these centers, there is the the ban of uh, in-kind payment of workers. In other centers instead, where the work organization is a putting out system, the payment in nature is, 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 is quite um, usual. The municip municipal legislation in France and royal legislation say you do not have to pay workers uh, in kind, they have to be paid in cash. And which, and which currency to, to, to pay these workers in cash? In, 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 in France, we have the copper coins, no value, and they pay workers using the copper coins, having no value or ridiculous value, where sometimes we have conflicts and also clashes on the payment in kind. Commodities, the market value is too, uh, is too much disproportion with the real market value for paying workers, I don't know. Also, the third case have been sharing from Prato. Workers being in a quite miserable situation they are really subjects, so they're just the mean, the mean, um, being um, oppressed by rule makers. 
also they had the deep power to, to appeal to, to jurisdiction. So, I mean, different uh, groups of, uh, di uh, of workers, uh, uh, dyers in Prussia are paid in, in kind. Very often, quite often, they resort to the low court of the guild, say they pay us in kind, which is not good. And that's it, I mean. And for the question by uh, Robert, the evolution over time, so it's quite difficult to answer. I, I've been shown three cases with different time times. The first case was on registers, too many registers. I didn't uh, uh, didn't uh, didn't consult all the registers yet, so I cannot answer this point for the time being. The evolution, at least for the first period I studied, I have no idea to speak about this evolution, no way to speak of the evolution. I'm not ready yet. The only answer I can provide is about the textile industry. Also, to be in line with Maria Fusaro's question, from the seven, from the 16th to the 19th century, we have a payment in kind made also in the textile industry. So workers being dominated, you know, like subjects, you know. And also, and also, it was quite difficult to value uh, commodities of goods given as payment. For the question by Salvatore, radical, he said I was radical. Salvatore said I was ra radical in my presentation. But with the contemporary uh, 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 period, I took that example. These things still exist. Uh, so, um, to which extent, I don't know. I'm not the scholar of the contemporary time or period. So these, 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 these things still exist. They're still present. Just considering one part now, the monetary part of remunerations. You mentioned also the uh, footballers, the football players, but also we have a lot of, of uh, I mean, uh, CEOs. Uh, they receive a lot of benefits in kind, uh, more than, I mean, ordinary employees of workers, blue or white colors at a corporate level. So it's also very important who is entitled to receive a payment in kind and not. Maybe the top executives are more entitled than the, the others to receive payment in kind. Who knows? But I'm not a scholar or expert of, of contemporary times. And now we turn to the questions for Petrovist. First one is David Kuzma. Thank you for the, thank you for this communication. Very, very uh, challenging. That's uh, obvious. That we think of. Uh, we, we think of uh, just uh, a different system. So, so for the payment of taxes, a different system for paying taxes. For the pawn shop. So these were small artisans, entrepreneurs, so bourgeoisie people. They were just uh, fiscal uh, poor guys. You know. And I come straight to my questions, two questions indeed. In modern era, in the old low countries, we have special groups of, of specialists being uh, evaluators. So is it possible, with your account, to get some information about the evaluation process? So 100% of the pawn or not? It turns out to be difficult to understand. For direct levies, you're going to pay these direct levies with these pawns in order to, to, to be, to be um, good. And these, these uh, Pawn shop. This idea has been 
as being as being also mm, I mean turned into a real and bigger one in the modern era. Thank you for your communication. It is in the period of being covering. I want to know, did you study your archives for a period from 260 up to 280? Did you, did you see a sort of economic uh, I mean, crisis as to the use of poles or pledges. Yeah, co. Okay. Thank you. This was very interesting. Uh, what we basically see, if I understand you correctly, is a town government that enters the pawnbroking business to a certain extent. And I'm just wondering if there is, because of taxation demand for credit, why don't you see um, a professional pawnbroker or a local wealthy inhabitant stepping up and extending credit? And in addition to this, um, is this type of behavior of the government of the town you are studying, is this unique or is this something that you see elsewhere in the area you study as well? Catherine Verna. Donc, euh, merci pour ces communications. Ma, ma question s'adresse à Jessica Petroviste, donc une source exceptionnelle hein, euh, comme celle que propose Alphonse de Poitiers. Alors, Thank you very much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. This case is very specific, it's very interesting. And also I want to say the extension of the royal presence. So I want to know what's happening when pawns have to be redeemed, the pawn has to be redeemed. So there might be a problem. Something happened during the year. So maybe the pawn has been sold, and then the pawn has to be redeemed. And now can we m imagine this transaction of, of uh, redeeming the pawn? Was it possible once the pawn was sold? I don't know. Now, now, now we, we have to consider the new way to value these pawns. That's an individual transaction between the council and the parties involved. And what about the real price, the real value of this pawn, this pledge? I'm thinking of Lens, I'm thinking of Marseille and other towns. I want to know now, how do you formalize this? How can you formalize these um, a pawn um, when being redeemed? Initiative. Hi, thank you so much for the paper. Um, I was um, kind of wondering about the relationship between this practice of um, paying taxes partly in kind and monetization. So you mentioned that one of the reasons um, for doing this may be a lack of liquidity on the part of the taxpayers. Um, do you think it's possible that, other than a lack of liquidity, it may be a desire to hold on to liquidity? In other words, could this be a choice? Kind of building on the pawnbroker's question, um, this kind of seems like free credit. Do you think people may choose to take this option, even if they do have cash? Um, and the second component of my question is I wanted to know if there's any seasonality or seasonal patterns to this. In other words, can people maybe want to hold on to cash in anticipation of a seasonal market of fair, and then after the fair, pay the taxes. Thank you. Robert Braid. Thank you. 
Voilà, ma question est liée au... My question is related to the previous questions. So in case of of known payment, when the phone has to be paid, so in case of an extra value, so if this extra value goes to the town, there is a gain, or maybe when there is a phone, this is covering up the entire debt. What's happening? And the town, what can the town do when the phone is not covering up the the entire debt. Thank you for your questions. I'm going to answer these questions according to my sources. So, I mean, as to these uh, uh, pre world of uh, the pawn shop, it's very interesting. Uh, and in fact, so and in fact, I mean, so this system has been has been compared or compared with the modern pawn shop. No, because we speak of a small or small uh, town. In those years, we are at a climax, and starting from the second half of the 15th century. So Najak now in having just 200 inhabitants, so the population shrinks. The urban hierarchy goes down in this region. And so, I mean, there's the system. The evaluators, the evaluation process. OK, that's a question I ask myself many, many times, but I don't know. I don't know how these goods were, 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 I mean, valued. I know there will be a discussion between the, the, the consul, the consulate, and the ones who gave these objects, these chapters, as, as a poem. But we don't have more precise information about. For the, the, the question by Francine Michaud, Yes, some economy, um, I mean, uh, downturn. The economic uh, period studied is quite short, and it's been quite difficult to consider the evolution. The only thing we do see is the amount of objects uh, given as a pawn, which varies a lot. And so, over some years, I've been shown a flow chart. Over some years, I studied. It's not very proprietary, but in the long run, you, you might see some important peaks of surges, and so that's a sign of uh, uh, difficulties. But we have to verify at any time if this uh, debt has been settled or not. We, we They give an object as a pawn, but in most cases, the uh, pawn is going to be redeemed. So they settle the debt. So it turns out to be a bit difficult to know. Well, the brokers of the local market, the brokers of the local market, I would like to get more, more informative sources enabling me to answer all these questions. And so, so the ones who can just uh, uh, make credit in the place of the government, but they don't have this information. I just typed some accounts I consulted, uh, municipal accounts kept in France, which is just a good start. We have a wonderful list, but we don't have any additional piece of information. All the institutional, I mean, uh, uh, mechanism, everything which is run by a private uh, uh, stakeholders or players. We have no additional information to share. I'm, I'm, ve I'm very sorry. I have no additional sources to share. Catherine Bernard, you ask uh, when the parents are not redeemed. That's a big issue. I, I just want to tackle also in consulting these documents. Uh, in fact, any time a property is sold, it's all at the same price. Uh, so it settled uh, the debt for the same uh, uh, amount, uh, and the pen has been sold, and the debt has been redeemed. But the same amount, the same value. 
what does this mean when we record we redeem four or so from the sale of this pen. So the pen is being sold at four or six a sou, because four a sou to settle the debt and the other two sou given to for the other use. And, uh, and, and for so in in another case, another case in another northern town, we have some tests showing that the 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 consuls can also sell by public auctions. So we know that we have also some public auctions, sales by public auctions, and so prices which can be lower in public auctions. For Najaka, I've been looking for some additional traces. I started from this principle that this was a, a sale, a public sale with the, with the, with the auction. This was my initial idea, but they don't know anything about this. For the question about uh, the the ways of payment in cash and in kind, I'm very I'm very puzzled from any evidence of two possibilities uh, being given to the debtors. The first possibility they say we're going to pay, we will be paid and we, we record this debt, or they say we're going to pay, and that's an object as a pawn to, to, be, uh, to, be, to be safe, just to be on the safe side. This, these are the main people over the years with different, different situation. So we, we, we just uh, register one debt for uh, uh, sou, and then another debt six sou. So we're different uh, types of debts. I don't know. I don't know how this was really done. These are some assumptions of mine, and no doubt, also in function of the economic crisis variations. So maybe this can work. I think that everything is connected with the availability of the households, uh, in function of the real uh, domestic crisis, in function of what is coming uh, from the rents. Okay, so we have a rent which is going to be given to us in six months, and we're going just to settle that after the after this income, and then we we just waiting for such and such income. Although we don't know if the crop is going to be good, and so we are just in this case. We're going to do to be safe. We're going to pay, but please give me just the stuff, and if the crop is going to be good. I will give you the. Uh, uh, I, I will keep my stove, and if the crop is going to be bad, I will. Gi I will give you my stove. So that's the only, the only situation to envisage. Is the only possible explanation. But uh, I want to find out the different ways to better understand the situation as such. And for the uh, issue or question by Robert. So in the case of non-payment, non-payment, uh, in case of sale of the pawn, for the Nasha case, I don't know, for to lose is more, uh, is more um, understandable. We have a, a register of accounts. We have two or three pages. Uh, see the consulate sales, some, some, uh, some, some commodities, and the surplus is given to the owner. So the account shows that the pound was for a four sou debt. The sale was a six sou uh, auction, and we gave two sou to the owner of these objects. That's very clear. For Najak, for Najak, as already said, this keeps going. We don't know exactly how this was. The same when the the pound is not covering uh, uh, up the the um, total debt. The pawn has to respond to the value of the debt. When the debt is small, we have objects of poor, poor quality, so also some pierced coats. And any time when it is sold, so we also see people just buying old stoves, not very expensive. Any time the as to cover up the total amount of the debts incurred. Are there any other questions? 
If not, please join me in thanking our panel for a series of excellent papers. Très bien.